Let me go live on YouTube. Going live on YouTube. Okay, so welcome to this session on quantum cryptanalysis. Before we start, a quick reminder. So please respect the ISR code of conduct, which means in particular that you have to use your real name as an attendee and also don't share the link for the Zoom webinar. Okay, so this session is moderated by four PC members. Uh, Jian Guo, Bart Manning, Gregor Neander, and Gilles Vanash. And so please, we can start. Okay, so welcome everyone to this session on quantum crypto analysis. So we have four talks and um, each of uh, the talks will be given five minutes. Um, for the questions, uh, we ask the attendees to type them in the Q&A interface of Zoom. Um, so now um, I'm going to ask Akinori to give his talk about finding hash collisions. So you can share your screen. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, you can see your screen. Uh, can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for introduction. I'm Akinori Hosoyamada from NTT Secure Platform Laboratories and the Nagoya University. This is a talk on dedicated quantum collision attacks on concrete hash functions. Uh, this is a joint work with user study. First, suppose that there is a concrete hash function H. And it is widely believed that if this hash function H is secure in the classical setting, then it will also be secure in the quantum setting. This is a common belief on security of hash functions. However, our result shows that this common belief does not necessarily hold. Next, I will explain classical backgrounds. So uh, let A be a concrete hash function. Then the classical generic collision attack finds a collision of H with the time complexity 2 to the power n over 2. So in the classical setting, a dedicated collision attack is considered to be valid only if its time complexity is less than 2 to the power n over 2. And in the classical setting, we usually use uh, some kind of differential cryptanalysis to find a collision of hash function. And the attack complexity T of a differential cryptanalysis based attack is mostly dominated by the 12 probability P, 
So the time complexity is approximately equal to one over P. And the attack is considered to be valid if and only if the value for the P is greater than the birthday bound two to the power minus N over two. And next, I will explain our observations. First, we observed that there exists a gap between the speed up for general reporting attacks and the speed up for differential cryptanalysis with quantum computers. For generic collision attacks, the quantum speed up is always less than quadratic. On the other hand, for differential cryptanalysis, we can obtain a quadratic speed up. And after seeing this situation, we had these observations. First, differential probabilities that are smaller than the birthday bound cannot be used in the cluster setting, but may be used in the quantum settings. And even if a hash function is secure in classical setting, if there exists a differential trail with probability between two to the power minus n over two and two to the power minus two n over three, it may be broken in the quantum settings. And we developed very complex based on these observations. Next, I will explain applications. For attack the reduced round variance of AES, MMO, and WARP. In the classical setting, the best collision attacks are six rounds for ASMMO and five rounds for WARP. Uh, in our paper, we developed dedicated collision attacks on uh, seven round ASMMO and six round WARP. And this is the new trail using our quantum attack on seven round AES. Actually, our attack is a quantum version of the rebound attack. And here, the differential probability p is 2 to the power minus 80, which is too small to use in the classical setting because this is smaller than the birthday bound. However, we can use uh, this trail in the quantum setting because uh, this is still greater than 2 to the power minus 2 over 3 times 128. Uh, so uh, we developed a quantum version of the rebound attack by using this differential trail. And here, uh, since I don't have enough time, uh, I don't explain attacks on Whirlpool. And here, I want to uh, explain some remarks. We considered three quantum settings depending on available quantum computational resources. And our attacks are valid in some quantum settings, but invalid in other quantum settings. And this is the summary of today's my talk. First, classically secure does not imply quantum secure for concrete statutory, uh, for Security of concrete hash functions. And differential trails with too small probability in the classical setting can still be meaningful for quantum computers. And we've improved collision round for AES, MMO, and Whirlpool. And finally, I want to claim that differential trails hash should not stop with probability, the first event, but should consider up to two to the power minus two and over three or more. We should revisit differential trails as activities because there will be many differential trails that cannot be used in the classical setting, but can be used in the quantum settings. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. OK. Thank you very much. Um, so the next talk is about quantum key search on AES and OMC. And the, the talk will be given by Fernando. So Fernando, you can share your screen. Thank you. OK. Is it available? Is it feasible? All right, so I'll be presenting implementing Crover Oracles for quantum key search on AES and OMC. And this is joint work with Samuel Jakes, Michael Nerig, and Martin Rothfeller. As part of the call for proposals for post quantum secure uh, uh, encryption schemes and uh, signature digital signature schemes, NIST put out uh, five definitions of security categories that the schemes can claim to belong to. And three of these uh, categories are defined based on the harness of running key search against AES. And in the quantum setting, in particular, um, running quantum key search, which they consider to be possible only by using Grover's algorithm. The problem with Grover's algorithm is it parallelizes very badly. And contrary to classical exhaustive key search, um, it doesn't perfectly parallelize. So if one uses S machines to try to uh, cut the depth of the, or the total time of the attack, uh, this can only be cut by a factor about square root of S rather than S. As a rule of thumb, one can consider the cost of running uh, parallel key search using S machines instead of one as an increase in, in a gate count or in area of the circuit by around a factor of square root of S. 
to address this uh, trade-off, what NIST does is that they consider uh, or they suggest considering gate counts as a metric for the cost of attacks, and they consider limiting the total circuit depth that can be considered also as the total time that one has to run the circuit by a fixed max depth constraint. Then to provide concrete numbers uh, for the security categories, they look at uh, quantum circuits for AES by Grassel et al to do their parallel analysis and, and, uh, and estimate these costs. What we observed is that the grass little work uh, was focusing on minimizing the total width of the circuit, or in other words, the total number of qubits used by the circuit, and not the depth. And this is because they assume a setting when there is no max depth, and they can just run non-parallel unbounded Grover search. So we wonder what would happen if we were to minimize depth instead. To do this, we uh, redesigned circuits for a yes, uh, applying the following changes. We changed the S-box uh, into a Boyer Peralta variant of the S-box that minimizes end depth. We also change our implementation of a quantum end gate for a smaller one than the one used by Grassel et al. We change the way we do key expansion. We use an in-place on-demand key expansion routine that parallelizes the Xbox computations inside the key expansion with the Xbox computations inside the round function. We change the, the, the mixed column circuit. And uh, we also look at various parallelization strategies and we still try to minimize width while uh, keeping maximum success probability. Finally, we implemented all of this in Q-sharp, and this was so that we could uh, run unit tests on the code so we know that we implemented AES, and we could easily modify the code and also get automatic circuit size estimates. Now, the paper has lots of tables and comparison between different uh, cost metrics and different previous work, uh, but uh, here I'm presenting basically the table that uh, NIST presented in their call for proposals updated very on, uh, on this work finding. And in particular, if we look at the approximation column, this interpolates the results for the different values of max depth. And we can see that we, in some sense, cut the cost in, a, in gate count of the attacks by about 13 bits throughout the categories. Of course, this is still a black box attack. So it's still a hugely impractical attack, but, uh, but uh, given the security definitions, they, the security categories, they can be updated uh, like this. Uh, also, we look at LOMC. LOMC is a family of block ciphers designed for having very low multiplicative complexity, and they are used as part of the picnic digital signature submission. And in particular, a key recovery attack against LOMC can result in an attack against picnic. So we decided to cost how much a quantum key recovery costs, and, um, and we ended up finding that it's uh, more expensive, to the best of our knowledge, it's more expensive than AES uh, in terms of gate count. And this is mostly due to the key scheduling procedure of LOMC, which is much bigger uh, in terms of quantum gate count than the one for AES. Finally, for future directions, uh, the obvious ones are improving the AES and LOMC oracles by either using automated uh, compilers or quantum compilers that are there or other techniques. Uh, for example, for LOMC at Eurocrypt 19, there was a, a new design that uh, should reduce the size of the key scheduling in, the, in a quantum implementation. Also, we could redo this analysis in the surface code setting uh, where there are different constraints and, uh, and that could uh, have an impact on the numbers. Um, also, many of the post-quantum candidates do a quantum cryptanalysis that includes Grover, but not all of them are keeping uh, max depth as a factor in consideration. And so it would be interesting to see what happens to, to, the, to the schemes if they were to try to do a similar analysis. Um, another consideration is the fact that qubits are not free. So maybe uh, adding a constraint like max width could be interesting because uh, for many of the categories, it might mean that only low probability attacks can fit within max depth and max width against the AES. So maybe that, that should be considered. And finally, we didn't investigate uh, anything in a multi-target uh, quantum attack setting. So that could be also something to, to look at. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So the next talk is about optimal merging in quantum KXOR and KSM algorithms. And the talk will be given by André. So André, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mm. Share your screen. Yeah, if it works. Yes. OK. Do you see my screen? Yes. Sorry? Yeah? You might want to enlarge this. Yeah, it's slides. going to be. OK. OK, uh, so this paper is about a class of quantum algorithms based on a quantum search that solve generalized Bosley problems, so KXO and KSM uh, problems. 
So I, as I have only five minutes, I'm going to take my favorite examples. Uh, k, k is going to be equal to, to four. And we're going to take a random function that produces uh, random elements. And we want to find a sum of these elements that goes to zero. Um, I'm going to first focus on the problem where this function is n bit to n bit. So we have expectedly many solutions. But the problem is also very interesting where there is, for example, only a single solution expectedly. So the classical idea that we use uh, to solve this problem dates back to uh, Wagner's algorithm, and it's the following. We're going to query first uh, to, to build lists of elements. We're going to query uh, h of x for many x's. And we're going to take lists of size 2 to the number 3, because this is optimal. And then we're going to repeat an operation which consists in uh, looking at two lists and computing the list of all sums that have some zero prefix. And if we, if we repeat that, we can increase the number of zeros that we have. And in the end, we have a full zero prefix, which means we have a list sum to zero. So in the case of k equals four, we take two the lists of size to the number three. We merge them this way into two lists um, and we want an n over three bit zero prefix. And then between these two lists, we expect to have a collision with high probability because we only have two n over three bits to, to, um, to put to zero. So our initial problem was how to uh, use, uh, to, to design good quantum algorithms for that. And the best, the, one of the best tools we have for this kind of problems is quantum search. So we wanted to use quantum search basically in this tree. Uh, here is an idea, and actually it's a classical idea. We want to use quantum search, but then let's use classical search uh, and let's rephrase the algorithm in a way that uh, is amenable to classical search. So we're going to build the list in a different order. We're going to build parts of the tree, uh, the list that I put in blue here. And then we're going to do a search. And this search is a search among the elements of L1, uh, this list at the lowest level. Uh, for an element that yields uh, ultimately a solution in L0. If we stream the elements of L1, then we stream the elements of L1 join L2. And if we do that, we uh, stream the potential elements of L0. And it turns out that th since it is a, an exhaustive search among L1, then we can replace it by a quantum exhaustive search. And we have a square root speed up on quantum search. Um, but if you want to do that really efficiently, then we need to uh, somehow rebalance the tree because the blue lists uh, still need a time to the number three. So we get a tree which looks like this, where we have small intermediate lists that we need to build, and then a uh, quantum search over bigger subspace. Um, so all of these concerns merging when there are many solutions. Um, when there is only a single solution, the situation is a bit different, but actually, uh, many algorithms that we use can be rephrased as merging algorithms as well. Take, for example, Chopin and Shamir's algorithm. Actually, Chopin and Shamir's algorithm, so this is to solve the problem of finding a solution when we, we merge four lists, uh, but there is a single solution. So the lists are of size 2 to the number 4. This algorithm consists in doing a merge, um, but since there is only a single solution, we have to repeat this merge for every possible prefixes. And we take not a zero prefix here, but any possible prefix, and we repeat this for all prefixes. And since we're repeating something for, for any prefix, um, let's do a quantum search as well. Let's, let's do a Grover search over all the possible prefixes, and inside, we'll do a merging operation. And this is only a simple extension that allows us to target all possible uh, case and problems and merging problems with any number of solutions. So there are many applications to the paper, uh, for example, all the subset sum, parity check problems, LPN, multiple encryption, and so on. All of this, all of this is detailed in the paper. And also we have, uh, we use the code to optimize uh, the time complexities and to find the best strategies. Because you see the complexities are always exponential in N and finding the best, uh, the good exponent is um, a linear optimization problem, which is why we, uh, we obtain optimal strategies among all the possible strategies for using quantum search and merging in this kind of algorithms. So thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you very much. So the next talk is about the quantum complexity of the continuous hidden subgroup problem. And the talk will be given by Kuhn. So Kuhn, the floor is yours. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Great. Am I audible? Yes. Great. Okay. So, uh, hello. Um, I would like to tell you about our work on the quantum complexity of the continuous hidden subgroup problem. My name is Kuhn de Boer, and this is joint work with Leo Duca and Serge Sphere. So, let's start with what the continuous hidden subgroup problem is. Um, in quantum computing, there is something called the hidden subgroup problem. It involves finite groups, uh, abelian groups, and it can be solved by Shor's algorithm. The continuous hidden subgroup problem is a generalization of it. It also includes infinite groups, like r to the power m, the real vector space. Um, uh, the continuous hidden subgroup uh, problem actually reads as follows. It, it's about finding an approximate basis of the period lattice of a sufficiently nice periodic oracle function. So uh, in pictures, it looks like this. This is the periodic oracle function. And uh, we would like, uh, after finally sampling this uh, oracle function, we would like to find an approximate basis of this lattice, the period lattice. Um, why uh, is the continuous hidden subgroup problem important for us? Well, if you can solve the continuous hidden subgroup problem, you can also uh, compute unit groups and class groups. And from there, you can find mildly short factors in ideal lattices of uh, yeah, certain cyclotomic number fields. And um, uh, it, it was long believed that, that finding short factors here is as hard as finding short factors in arbitrary lattices. But from the work of Eisentrager, uh, where we improve on, it follows that this entire tree is actually in quantum polynomial time, meaning that those uh, that finding short factors here is actually seems to be easier than uh, finding short lattices in arbitrary lattices, uh, finding short factors in arbitrary lattices. Okay, so our contribution, uh, we simplified the algorithm and we refined the analysis of Eisentrager at all. To be specific, our analysis is uh, quantified. So uh, our complexity is with explicit polynomials and dependencies on all parameters. And also our analysis is modular. It, has, uh, uh, it consists of uh, uh, independent parts. So that makes it easier for future researchers to, to specialize and improve. Uh, a summary of our result looks like this. Uh, if your periodic oracle function f uh, doesn't have a too large Lipschitz constant, the algorithm requires those resources. And here m is the dimension of your hidden lattice. Um, the main technical challenge uh, in the analysis was to bound the errors caused by discretizing and windowing the Fourier, the continuous Fourier transform. Because um, uh, the algorithm involves a Fourier transform. We would like to apply a continuous Fourier transform because the function uh, is a real function on a continuous domain. But in real life, we cannot apply a, a continuous Fourier transform. We can only apply a finite Fourier transform. And this, uh, then you lose information and that causes noise, that causes errors. Um, the, the discretizing errors uh, to bound those we needed an improvement of the Udin Jackson theorem. And to bound the windowing errors, we needed the Poisson summation formula. And to analyze the final waveform, we applied smoothing techniques as introduced by Misiancio and Regev. I would like to finish with five open questions, uh, uh, I think uh, are very interesting. Um, as I already said, you can uh, solve unit group and class group computations. Um, but if you want to do that, you have to explicitly compute the Oracle function. 
So if you really want to know what is the complexity of unit group computations on the quantum computer, you need to know the complexity of those specific oracle functions. That is something to, uh, nice to research. Uh, the next two open questions are about how to exploit uh, uh, knowledge about the hidden lattice. So if you already know something about your hidden lattice, uh, can you improve the complexity? And uh, you can think about the symmetry of a lattice or that you might know uh, uh, sub-lattices of the hidden lattice. The fourth question is about numerical stability in the classical post-processing step. And, and the last question is about um, finding assumptions on the oracle function that could improve the complexity. Uh, think about smoothness assum uh, assumptions. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for listening and I hope, to, uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk. Okay, thank you very much and thanks for to all the speakers of uh, this session. So I guess now we switch to the questions. I don't know who wants to start. So we collected some questions. Um, some of them have already been answered. Let's still go over them for the YouTube channel. Um, there was one question to uh, Akinori from Rafa Fan. Uh, your summary does not reveal how the quantum setting can lead to better differential trails. Can you roughly elaborate on this? Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so the speed up, uh, we, we can obtain uh, such small differential probability because uh, in the cluster setting, uh, Roughly speaking, uh, the time complexity of the time that is based on that is one of the P. Okay? And the individual time complexity is 2 to the power n over 2. And so, class, uh, in the classical setting, the differential trace is valid if and only if P is greater than the first step up. This is uh, the condition in the classical setting. Uh, next, in the quantum setting, the general time complexity is uh, roughly speaking 2 to the power n over 3 and not n over 4. I mean, the speed up is less than quadratic. And on the other hand, we can obtain a quadratic speed up for differential cryptanalysis, and the time complexity becomes the square root of 1 over p. And so, uh, now, in the quantum setting, the attack is valid if and only if the square root of 1 over p is less than uh, 2 to the power n over 3. And this condition is equal to p is greater than 2 to the power minus uh, 2n over 3. Uh, this is why uh, we can use smaller probability than the birthday bound in quantum setting. OK, uh, thank you. A question to Fernando from uh, Jan Boti. Which structure, the S box, the mixed column, etc., turned out to be most difficult when trying to reduce the depth? And also, right. how is the trade off between width and depth handled? Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, for the single structures, it was, uh, um, in some sense, surprisingly easy because uh, there is already a lot of hardware literature. Um, on this. And so what we did is we looked at the sh shallowest uh, circuits that were available on the literature. And many of these are either implemented in something like Verilog or are expressed in papers as linear programs. And those um, are very easy to translate into quantum, into quantum circuits that are still classically simulatable. So we did direct translations. Um, the hardest part was how to figure out, um, in some sense, the order and how to interleave the key expansion routine with uh, the rest of the round to try to save as much depth because sometimes uh, a wire might be waiting for new key. And so certain things sometimes can be done uh, before a certain XOR and some others. And so that requires a little bit of, of, uh, of playing around. Uh, but we have full circuit designs on the paper if you're curious about that. And for uh, the um, trade-off, the hardest that we had was mixed column where we had two implementations. One was, um, um, one was a, a very small one by Maximov that came while we were working on this. And the other was an in-place, very, uh, let's say, reducing width, very narrow one um, that we wrote um, a Sage compiler to generate. And uh, between the two, we just tried costing the full attack on both. And then we went for the one that had the smallest gate count and area, circuit area. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, let me go to a question to Andre from 
um, Wang Mao Ning, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, um, da, 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 da. Do you prove that your parameters selected are optimal or, di or did you try some different groups and choose the best one among them? Yes, yeah, so this is a very good question uh, because there is optimal is in title, of course. It's optimal among all the strategies that we defined. So we define like this whole set of possible strategies where you use quantum search and you use merging. And then uh, we also like try it uh, to, to optimize uh, in practice uh, using uh, MILP. And then we also like give proofs uh, in this set of strategies. So the question is, if, if you want to have a better algorithm, then we have to go outside this space, uh, whether by using something else on quantum search, maybe quantum works, I don't know, or, or maybe uh, using different strategies that we didn't think of, but uh, yeah. Okay, there is a related question from the same person uh, in Shamir, 2012 dissection algorithm. Um, I'm not familiar with it, but uh, their partition is biased. The list sizes are different. Um, and there are also other papers discussing the way of choosing the list size. Uh, how about yours? So um, I'm, I'm not sure what it refers to. So uh, I'm afraid. Um, so, uh, so we can like, uh, so the, the idea of the dissection algorithms is that uh, if you have a if you have a problem which is also it's they say the bicomposite problem but basically uh, something that looks like a merging problem for me uh, k wise uh, then uh, you can reduce the memory used uh, similarly as a Schopel Shamir but generalized and uh, you can also see that uh, as a merging extended with loops over uh, so similarly as in Schopel Shamir. And uh, all the merging, all the dissection algorithms, I think, uh, or at least uh, many of them translate into this framework and uh, they have like quantum versions. Um, and you also have uh, the same kind of uh, time memory trade-offs where if you limit the size of the list, then you can obtain this uh, quantum time complexity and so on. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but... Uh, so if you didn't answer the question, please, uh, yeah. questioner, um, raise your voice again. Um, another question, which I think goes to Kuhn, about the hidden subgroup problem. What impact does this finding have on the current ideal lattice NIST candidates? The question is coming from Scott Fleur. OK, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, the, the result actually does not affect uh, crypto approximation factors of shortest factor problem. It only shows that we uh, apparently that ideal shortest factor problem is apparently harder for higher uh, approximation factors. So for a linear or polynomial approximation factor uh, of uh, the shortest factor problem, there's not really a uh, direct uh, impact. Does it answer the question? I cannot answer that, um, but uh, <laughs> I hope it answers the question. Otherwise, please ask it again. Yeah. Um, let's see if I have another question. Did I miss some question? Uh, a question from Frever Kautere to Fernando. So the security level of NIST NIS 1 has now changed. So some quick purposes. Oh, 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 my screen is moving. A uh, question from Frey to Fernando. So the security level of NIST-1 has now changed. So some crypto systems that were not NIST-1 are now NIST-1. I think it's more of a joke or? Well, in some sense, uh, everybody that had a scheme running for NIST, uh, if they believe in our tables are more secure for free. Um, but yeah, the, the change is small, but uh, it might be if, uh, if anybody was doing a cryptanalysis up to that level of detail and uh, and they care about the uh, generic gate count, then maybe yes, but uh, but there are many aspects. It also depends on the assumption of whether, what's the relative cost of T gates versus other quantum gates and so on. Okay, so there was one question to, to Akinori and um, he already answered this in the chat because the, the voice is a bit um, harder. And um, so let, let's still try to do this uh, once again. Have you considered looking at the SHA-2 family will significantly improve the maximum number of steps that we can find a collision? Is a question from Xiangman Sim. And there's a follow-up question from Caroline Brown of what about SHA-3 or Blake-2? Uh, yeah. 
uh, actually, uh, Jax uh, is definitely a very uh, good data collector. Uh, and actually, uh, we have, uh, uh, yeah, about that. Uh, but I cannot say uh, many things about our own work research. Thank you. Um, are we missing some other questions? I'm looking at the other moderators. Maybe I missed some. Okay, it seems that we're done. Is if that's okay with the, the, the chairs that we were done 10 minutes in time. Are there any other questions and ask them now? Otherwise we stop the, the session, I think. Yeah, moderators, if you have any questions of your own, that's your opportunity. Uh, so there is a question to Akinori, please type the answer instead because the voice is quite bad. So if you still mind to have a look at the, the Q&A for this. Okay. No problem, no problem. Um, so I think uh, this, this Hmm? I guess this concludes the session, right? So then I would like to thank all the... Hmm? I would like to thank all the speakers then. But maybe Gregor wants to say something. No, 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 no. Sorry. Okay. 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 Then I, get, um, I should give the word back to the chairs or what's going to happen now? Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone, all speakers and moderators. And the next session is on secure computation in 25 minutes, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, UTC. So see you all there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.